Good afternoon. I'm moderator Go Eun Jung, professor of sociology at Gyeonggi University. It's an honor to chair uh, today's event, Global Women Readers Intergenerational Dialogue with Global Women Readers Voices. As the global crisis COVID-19 is sweeping around the world, we are having a virtual conference which is casted on YouTube simultaneously. Now we are going to begin Global Women Readers Intergenerational Dialogue under the theme of Women's Voices for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment. We have three renowned speakers today, Ms. Irina Vokova, Ms. Susanna Malkora, and Ms. Soyang Lee. Ms. Irina Vokova is Honorary Director of Humanitas College of Gyeonggi University and the former Director General of UNESCO. Ms. Susanna Malkora is Dean of the IE School of Global and Public Affairs in Spain and the former Minister of uh, Foreign Relations of Argentina. And Ms. Soyang Lee is Asia Regional Manager in Microsoft Korea and a frequent speaker of TV programs, including 15 Minutes to Change the World, which is the Korean version of TED Talk. And finally, we have five Gyeonggi students, So Young Kim, So Young Song, Hena Baek, Sun Bong Kim, and Ka Hyun Koo. Now, I will briefly present the background and goal of the today's event. This conference is supported by Global Women Readers Voices, a group of 54 women readers working in governments and multilateral organizations. They have been committed to promote humanitarian relief, advocate for, and enhance human rights, including women's rights. This support reflects United Nations' work to enhance gender equality. Especially, Global Women Readers' Voices aim to build a strong multilateral commitment across different countries and raise voices across different uh, generations. GWL Voices hold the Generation Equality Forum, which is a global gathering for gender equality, convened by UN Women and co-hosted by the Government of Mexico and France. The next forum will be convened in France in June this year. As a part of this support, GWL team has created spaces for dialogue with many young women readers in many different countries, including students in, uh, from IE University in Spain, Georgetown University, and Wesley College in the United States. As the only participating university from South Korea, Gyeonggi will represent and deliver Korean students' serious interest and passion for human rights, inclusion, and equality for women's issues. Today, we hold this event to share one of the most urgent gender issues in Korea, challenges that young Korean women face in the workplaces intersecting with structural constraints within labor market. So I believe that this will be a great opportunity for many young readers in Korea to learn more about successful global readership and think about how we can contribute to the global community. For today's event, uh, the Chancellor, In Won Jo of the Gyeonggi University System will give a welcoming speech. Uh, I will read uh, his welcoming remarks on behalf of the Chancellor Jo. On behalf of the Gyeonggi University System, I would like to congratulate and thank Honorable Madam Irina Vokova, distinguished panel participants, and students of Gyeonggi University and citizens who are with us through video streaming. For future generations living in very challenging time, today's dialogue between students and global women readers uh, will provide an invaluance, invaluable reference. At the same time, the distinguished readers of experience and wisdom will inspire our young readers seeking courage and insights into the future. Gender is an issue of all human beings and of our human societies beyond the question of biological differences. 
Since its founding, Kyungi has engaged in global and academic praxis, seeking a better human civilization for all people. For the past 27, uh, 72 years, we have paved the way for academy and peace to realize the spirit. I trust today's dialogue will be another milestone in Kyungi's history. We wish you all the best and invaluable fruits of the dialogue. Now, uh, let's invite our three speakers to share their insights and experiences as a global woman leader. Uh, first, please welcome Ms. Fukova, who is joining us from Paris. She will speak how multilateralism is important for gender equality and women's empowerment. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Govan Jung. Uh, it's uh, indeed for me uh, a big pleasure to be back to Kyunghee University. Uh, my only regret is that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, I could not join you uh, in person the last year. But uh, uh, let me say that uh, I'm particularly grateful to uh, Chancellor Cho uh, for uh, his uh, very warm welcome. And I'm sure that uh, this dialogue uh, will be fruitful. Uh, from my own experience, uh, I know how much uh, the faculty staff, professors and students uh, are interested uh, in the questions of uh, gender equality, which reflects, uh, I believe, the drive uh, for modernity uh, to an inclusion uh, for the Korean society uh, in general. <clears throat> Um, I would like, and I'm very pleased that I'm here with my dear friend and uh, former colleague, uh, Susanna Malcora, with whom we have uh, uh, started uh, this uh, network of uh, women uh, for uh, change uh, and uh, for global leaders for change and inclusion. Uh, but before uh, that, uh, let me just give a brief overview of what multilateral system and what the United Nations has brought to uh, gender equality and women's empowerment, because I believe it is indeed important uh, to know history. Um, we know that the commitment of the United Nations uh, to advancement of women began already with the signing of the United Nations Charter uh, already uh, in 45, and last year we celebrated the 70th anniversary of the uh, United Nations. Um, but uh, it's very interesting to look at history because of the uh, signatories, the signatories that were at this convention, the uh, Charter of the United Nations, actually they were only uh, for uh, women. Uh, and if you look at the picture, uh, the photo, the famous photo of the signing of um, in San Francisco, the conference, uh, you could hardly see uh, women's faces. And then immediately after that, uh, in 1946, uh, the United Nations created the Commission on the Status of Women to ensure uh, equality and to promote women's rights. Um, even the Commission was established when not all countries uh, have uh, included in their laws and legislations uh, the, right, the rights of women, the right of women to vote. Um, and the first task of this uh, commission was, of course, to enshrine into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, that all human beings uh, are free and equal in dignity and rights, uh, and it uh, included uh, women. But at that time, mostly the uh, Commission on the Status of Women focused on women's political rights uh, because it was uh, uh, the first step towards true equality. The uh, four years afterwards, uh, the uh, United Nations um, uh, gradually accelerated uh, its work and its attention, but the main, I would say, focus uh, and the driving uh, event uh, that uh, took part, it was by, uh, by no doubt uh, the uh, United Nations uh, Decade uh, for Women, uh, Equality, Development in Peace from 1975 to 1985. And this conference, indeed, this decade, with its three conferences, uh, sets the stage further on for the strong involvement and promotion of women's rights by the United Nations. The first conference uh, was in Mexico, 75, the second in Denmark, and the third in 85 in Nairobi. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, as a young diplomat, uh, I attended uh, two of these conferences uh, in 1980 and 90. 
1985, uh, uh, respectively in uh, Copenhagen and in Nairobi. And I remember the huge enthusiasm of, um, of governments, of the delegates and the NGO uh, uh, community uh, that uh, took part in these conferences. Uh, the uh, idea was uh, how to promote uh, this agenda. And there were a number of uh, initiatives. Um, there was a voluntary fund uh, for this uh, decade for women that was um, uh, established. Um, and one of the most, uh, I would say, uh, uh, positive results, uh, which had an impact, of course, was the adoption of the uh, convention uh, in 1979, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And I would like to say that nowadays, uh, this is one of the most widely ratified uh, convention uh, in the world, uh, I would say. Uh, and because of course, uh, my background uh, is from UNESCO, I would say that uh, it is probably the second one such convention. The most widely ratified is the Convention on the Protection of World Cultural and Natural Heritage. And after that, uh, which has 193 uh, states uh, parties, and then it's the uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of uh, Discrimination. Now this convention has uh, 189 state parties. It's indeed um, a very important uh, moment uh, for the United Nations and the committee uh, for the elimination of discrimination uh, against women was established, which uh, has an extremely important work. And then this convention uh, contributed to uh, a lot of change uh, in legislation, uh, in different even constitutions and adopting the legal provisions for equality of women. This was an extremely important uh, step for that. And then uh, the uh, idea of uh, moving forward, uh, making, of course, um, uh, the next step was very important. And I would say that since many, many decades, the United Nations uh, uh, has made, contributed to a considerable, significant progress uh, uh, in advancing uh, gender equality. Uh, the most probably important still document uh, is the uh, document adopted uh, at the major conference in 1995 the Beijing uh, Conference and the Declaration and Platform for Action. Uh, I believe uh, still this is probably one of the most uh, progressive documents uh, that was adopted. And last year, we celebrated uh, once again, we celebrated 25th anniversary. And on that basis, uh, this year, member states uh, decided to uh, continue and to launch this, uh, uh, the two conferences in Mexico and in uh, Paris and the intergenerational dialogue. The approach of the United Nations uh, is that uh, gender equality is a basic human right. We all remember the famous words of uh, uh, Hillary Clinton at that time, uh, uh, First Lady of the United States, uh, when she said exactly during the Beijing conference in 95 that uh, uh, women's rights are human rights. And this was really an important uh, recognition uh, of uh, the uh, equality agenda. But also the United Nations recognized that there are enormous also socioeconomic considerations and ramifications to, uh, uh, to consider and that uh, um, empowering women uh, indeed is important for economies, uh, uh, for productivity, for growth, for social inclusion. Uh, uh, and we have seen uh, all these years that uh, uh, indeed uh, there was uh, a lot of progress. But progress is still very slow. Uh, gender equality inequalities uh, remain deeply entrenched uh, uh, almost, I would say, in, uh, in every society. Uh, and um, either women uh, lack uh, political participation, representation, or they lack access to decent work, um, uh, some face occupational, uh, as we say, segregation. Uh, and of course, the big question about the uh, gender uh, wage gaps. Uh, and very often uh, in many countries, um, uh, they are denied access to basic education or healthcare. Uh, and uh, the recently, uh, I would say, a problem uh, for that um, we all, uh, the international community has been focused, uh, uh, UN, uh, member states, uh, civil society groups, is about violence uh, and discrimination. And that is why um, we uh, do believe that um, uh, the United Nations should continue to play its vital role. 
Uh, and the follow-up of all this work uh, during the decades, uh, by, all mean, uh, by all means, is the centrality of gender equality in the Agenda 2030 adopted in um, uh, 2015 by the United Nations, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, uh, and its uh, implementation, um, as it is well known that the, its implementation uh, it needs an uh, integrated and rights-based approach. Now, um, we know that uh, there is a special goal for gender equality, goal number five, which looks at all these um, uh, different aspects, uh, uh, but it is not only goal number five, and I, I would like to emphasize this, it's uh, uh, gender, uh, as we say, uh, gender equality empowering is uh, uh, integrated in almost uh, all the uh, other sustainable development goals, uh, be it in education, of girls' education, uh, uh, on all different levels, be it in climate, uh, the impact on climate and women and vice versa, uh, be it uh, uh, on um, goal 16, where we speak about uh, peaceful societies, uh, uh, be it uh, uh, in health, access to health, decent uh, jobs and work, and uh, I can continue the list. Now, just very, very briefly, uh, I would say to say that the United Nations has identified um, a few reasons for this uh, uh, um, gender inequality and what, what holds women back. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, it's uh, unequal access to education. It's lack of employment uh, uh, equality. And very interesting to see here that according to the World Bank, um, uh, women today uh, have uh, only three quarters of the rights of men. Uh, it's uh, uh, a bit surprising uh, to see here uh, the data by the World Bank, but uh, it is only eight economies in the world uh, that give women the same legal rights uh, as men. And in 155 countries, and I'm speaking about lack of employment equality, only 150, in 155 countries, at least one law exists that impedes women's economic opportunities. I did mention the uh, poor uh, medical care. Uh, we know that women overall receive lower quality medical care than men. And uh, uh, this is uh, linked uh, to uh, other gender inequality. Uh, of course, uh, it has an impact on it. Lack of political representation of all parliamentary seats, only half, only quarter, 25% uh, uh, are filled by women. Uh, although we can say that uh, the uh, share of women in parliaments uh, has increased over the years in many countries. Uh, there are uh, many more women in parliaments, but still uh, only one quarter uh, definitely uh, is not enough. And as of February 21, women serve as elected heads of state of government in just 21 countries. So um, I would like to say that despite progress in this area for many years, which we have to recognize, women are still grossly underrepresented in governments and political processes. This means, by the way, that certain issues uh, that female politicians tend also to bring up to the political agendas of their society, such as parental leave or childcare, pensions, gender equality laws, gender-based violence, are often neglected. Uh, societal mindsets, we should not forget about that. Um, uh, we know that gender prejudice and resulting gender discrimination begin in childhood. And from the moment they are born, girls and boys face unequal gender norms in many societies regarding expectations of their families, of their communities, of societies in general, and access to resource and opportunities. And all of this, of course, has lifelong consequences. Um, the uh, big issue, uh, which uh, for a very long time was the, I would say, the uh, hidden uh, problem that existed, of course, is the violence against women. Uh, according to the United Nations Women, or one in three women worldwide experience physical or sexual violence, sometimes by intimate partner, uh, and uh, uh, which has a long-term, once again, consequences, uh, physical, mental, uh, uh, but also violence uh, during conflict uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and wars. Now, um, just one word about the COVID-19 and gender uh, equality. We all know that uh, uh, crises are never gender neutral. 
and uh, COVID-19 is no exception. Uh, the recently published uh, report by the uh, United Nations, by United Nations Women in UNDP, uh, uh, showed that uh, the pandemic um, pushes uh, uh, almost 50 million women uh, and girls beyond the poverty line, uh, reversing decades of progress. We know that uh, more girls, million, million of girls will not go back to school after the uh, uh, lockdowns um, and the uh, consequences, there are dire consequences of women uh, in the uh, recovery uh, during the pandemic, of course, and in the uh, post pandemic recovery. Uh, at the end of my uh, presentation, uh, let me just say that um, another big agenda for the United Nations, very important agenda for the United Nations, um, as I did mention, was women, peace and security. Uh, and already in the Beijing platform of action, uh, it was recognized that um, peace is uh, inextricably linked to uh, equality, between women and men and in development uh, and emphasize the importance of full participation of women in prevention, in resolution of armed conflicts. Uh, and it was essential further on for the maintenance of peace and security. And uh, in uh, 2000, uh, the United Nations Security Council for the first time passed a landmark resolution 1325 on women, peace and security the first ever to address the impact of war on women, but not only looking at women as victims, which is very important, but looking also at women, uh, women's contribution to conflict resolution and sustaining peace. It calls again for equal participation of women with men in and their full involvement in all the efforts, negotiations and further on uh, in the maintenance of peace and security, but also it emphasizes the need to protect women and girls from human rights abuses, uh, including gender-based violence during such conflict. And it uh, uh, called for action to mainstream gender participation in relation to conflict prevention, peace negotiations, and the aftermath of conflict. A very important resolution that was followed by uh, several other uh, similar decisions uh, by the uh, United Nations and also what is very important that uh, as a consequence, uh, the International Criminal Court uh, or the, the other special courts that were created, uh, uh, for example, the International Tribunal for former Yugoslavia or the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, Rwanda they broke also new ground in the area of jurisprudence on sexual violence under international law. And already there are convicts uh, uh, for using rape as an instrument of genocide or uh, forms of torture. Uh, and actually it recognized rape as a crime against humanity. So to end my uh, presentation overall, uh, kind of a more global, more general presentation of the contribution of the United Nations, uh, I would say that uh, um, United Nations, the multilateral system, um, all the different uh, specialized agencies, funds and programs uh, uh, with all the different partners uh, have played and continue to play a critical role, a major role uh, in affirming uh, women's rights. Uh, of course, we have seen progress, but uh, uh, progress is very slow. Um, and according to the World Economic Forum, we know that we may need another uh, uh, century uh, in order to achieve uh, what we have inscribed into the uh, sustainable development agenda and what we want to see uh, as equality and empowerment uh, of women. But one should recognize also that without the strong leadership, without the commitment, without the huge convening power about the normative setting uh, instrument uh, uh, of the United Nations, uh, uh, many of the achievements uh, could not have been made. So uh, I would like to end by saying that the women's equality, uh, gender uh, equality, women's empowerment uh, is the uh, probably one of the most important and biggest challenge and agenda for the 21st century. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and I'm once again very glad to participate uh, in this uh, debate. And I'm sure that uh, uh, my friend Susanna will enlarge a little bit uh, some of the ideas that uh, I have thrown out in this debate.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Vukova. Now I would like to hand over the screen to Ms. Susanna Maikora. She joins us from Spain and she will present on the achievement of GWL Voices for Gender Equality. Please welcome Ms. Maikora. Good afternoon to you all. Good morning to, to Irina and a good day to all the people who are listening to us from through a, the streaming anywhere in the world. It's a pleasure to be here with you all, and I really appreciate the opportunity to partner with CUNY University and have this event together. Uh, thanks to the Chancellor for his welcoming, and uh, thanks to everybody who is participating. Before going to GWL in particular, let me, let me say something that connects me to Korea in a very special way. In my uh, life in the United Nations, I um, had the opportunity to work in different um, organizations within the United Nations. I work in the humanitarian world with World Food Program. I did peacekeeping. And the last four years of my career in the United Nations, I was chief of staff to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. So I have a very special connection to your country and it's a real pleasure to be back to this um, uh, conference that you have organized together with our GWL voices. Adding to what um, Irina had said uh, regarding the importance of the multilateral system and the United Nations uh, in, in setting the stage for uh, women empowerment and for women's rights, I would like to say that there is one element that is critical in the United Nations, and that is the ability to convene every year in CSW, in the Commission for the Status of Women that Irina describes so well, all countries, all member states, to discuss the advancement of the gender agenda. And that sets something that is central to moving a, the, the agenda forward, which is peer pressure among member states to show that they are really advancing in, in the question of, of gender rights. This has worked very well because enacting laws in each country is, is absolutely critical to make a difference, to have a real impact. And we have seen since uh, Beijing, since uh, uh, the, the Beijing platform and agenda was, was established, that indeed the, uh, every year we started to, to perceive the advancement and to notice that that peer pressure among countries, among governments, resulted in, in, a, in better a, a, a quality of laws being passed all over the world. I have to say that this has slowed down in the last few years. And in fact, um, one could argue that there has been a backlash in this regard. And there has been a counter reaction to the notion of women's rights as a central part of human rights in societies. And uh, to a certain extent, there has been a movement that starts to contradict the notion of women's rights versus family rights. The notion that women's rights somehow affect the values of families. And this is something that is very worrisome. It's a worrisome trend. It's a trend that has uh, given certain governments the notion of pushing back on certain laws that had been passed or slowing down new laws that should be enacted. And this is the basic reason why Irina, Helen Clark and myself started GWL Voices. We recognize the importance of gender rights and, and Irina has described it thoroughly the, the history of how we got here. But we also recognize having been in the system, having seen firsthand this, this very important pushback movement, 
that we needed to reemphasize once again how important the multilateral system was to preserve in the first hand and to uh, move forward the agenda that, as Irina indicated, unless we, we really move faster, it will take more than 100 years to get to full equality. That's why we decided to found GWA Voices. It's a group of women that are, a, a, all of us have been one way or the other, or the other involved in the multilateral system. We are 54 now. We started being three as founders. We are 54. And why do we call ourselves Voices for Change and Inclusion? Because we believe that each one of us on our own merit has a, a voice but coming together and raising our voices together in different, when we see different issues having merit to be, get involved is absolutely central. And that's what we are doing. We have been established more than two years now and, and we have raised our voices uh, uh, before the Security Council publicly uh, in different issues that really uh, uh, show and prove that gender equality is far from, from being achieved. And not only that, that uh, women are being targeted in many parts of the world, particularly during conflicts, as again, Irina mentioned. More recently, we have been very active on Generation Equality Forum, which is this forum that was established to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing agenda and the Beijing platform, but also it was established to re-energize that agenda and to define next steps to accelerate the process to achieve all the objectives that the agenda had defined, which are still not achieved in most parts of the world. And we felt uh, being women who had had a long career and had understood uh, uh, well the issues, but also that have a certain age that we needed to hear the voices of younger women. That in order for us to have an objective that has meaning to the younger generation, that has meaning to the future of women, we needed to hear women's, young women's voices. And that's why we established an intergeneration di dialogue, which this event is part of. Because we know what history has shown we have been part of institutions that mold this agenda, but we want to make sure that as we progress, as we really move forward, the priorities are set in a way that really makes sense to the younger generation. It's not for us to define that future alone, it's for us to help with our voices, shape it, with the input that the young women that are sitting with us here today and others that we have met in different occasions provide us with. So GWA Voices for Change and Inclusion is there today as a conduit to receive your input, to hear your perspective, to then uh, uh, propagate it through our uh, uh, advocacy and our capacity to raise our voices. and doing it in a manner that not only it puts in at the center women's rights, uh, gender equality, but associates to that the notion that the multilateral system is the best way to really make pr the progress that it still remains to be done. So that's where we are, that's what we do. And I really look forward to listening to you in this coming uh, 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 conversation that we are going to have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Susanna Maikora. This is excellent. Now, our final speaker is Ms. Soyang Lee. The title of her speech is Have You Contributed to the Success of Others? Let's welcome Ms. Lee. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you first for the Gyeong University and GWL for inviting me as a speaker. And um, it's my first time to uh, listen to how United Nations developed women rights in the global uh, sites, and then also how they are contributing to the future of uh, future generation of women's rights as well. 
Um, so today, I'm not actually, you know, the one who um, contributes to, you know, creating law or the, the legal policy because I'm working as an employee at one international company called Microsoft. Um, and I just do like to uh, bring my own experience how, um, you know, gender equality is important in, in, and how individual uh, people or em employee, including both uh, women and men, uh, can actually contribute to the uh, diversity and inclusion. So I prepared a slide deck. So can you open up the slide deck, please? Yeah. So I just briefly talk about my uh, backgrounds. So I'm working um, as a Asia Regional Manager, as well as I'm a community program manager called uh, Microsoft MVP and RD, which is most valuable professionals. But um, these professionals are not the one who contributes their own success, uh, but they, uh, those are the one who study themselves, but also uh, eager to share what they've learned or what they've studied or you know, their experience for the sake of uh, community. So we've been developed this program more than 25 years because we, you know, the Microsoft, you, you probably know already the Bill Gates um, created we, DOS, the first operator, uh, computer operation system. Um, when he, you know, created a computer operation system, um, everyone knows who, you know, even the developer knew that this is not easy for ordinary people, right? But there was a voluntarily, um, the community leader, voluntary, you know, uh, community leader who study themselves and learn themselves and then share uh, with the community. Like without no money operate, uh, provided by Microsoft, they just did um, for, for community growth. And we, you know, uh, Bill Gates started to recognize those people, and then we, you know, start to send, start to recognize those people with an award called Microsoft MVP Award. And it's, you know, this is the team that um, who organize these and help and support and find these people globally. And yeah, I'm in the middle of, um, you know, in the crowd. So. Yeah, I'm uh, even though based in Korea, and I also, I'm not Miss, I'm actually a mother of two kids. Uh, they are already grown up to teenagers, and then they didn't go to school for this pandemic time. And you would probably be very surprised how my day life would look like, day and night life would look like, because in the morning, I have to prepare meals for them, and then enter into the you know conference call, and then lunch prepare, and then uh, look after their classes. Um, this is you know, what why I'm sharing is you know, all these kind of uh, motherhoods like as a as a as a mom. It's not only mom does, but mom can do better though. <laughs> I I could find out that actually develops. Um, a kind of attitudes that you know um, I can contribute to the success of others, um, and as well as the experience what I've learned from the community leaders in our program, and um, that's for sure I can say. Uh, but anyway, uh, you will probably think I'm, you know, like um, maybe studying abroad, but actually. I, you know, briefly talk about my um, childhood. It's it's very very small country, southern part of Korea, just a small island called Gaoje Island, uh, and then you know like uh, being very very difficult to be uh, uh, approached with all foreigners. But um, you know all these the attitudes matters. So that's I'd like to share with you. And so, like, also, first, my career was not um, 
very successful because at that time I came into the society after um, the school, uh, it was IMF crisis, so economic crisis. So there was no um, open job. So I had to uh, create my own venture company called Wabajaba. You probably wouldn't know. But anyway, uh, because there was no, it, it was only four university um, classmates built a small venture company with, around internet. So there was no manager, like no one to learn from. Like, if obviously, there is no money, and then after three three years, that company just went bankrupt. So uh, you know, I had a very very you know unsuccessful career in my early age. But why I'm sharing this, it's uh, you know again I'd like to emphasize the attitudes. So in, you, in, especially like women feels. Not only for women, but uh, a lot of males as well. Recently, they feels if they don't have great backgrounds uh, with families or great education, they feel like they cannot succeed in the future. But that's that's totally not true. So w what I've learned is, you know, there was no manager. Like then it means I learn how to be a, a leader from the beginning. And this kind of leadership attitude is super important throughout the whole career. And also, no one to learn from, that means you have to look around teachers everywhere. So that attitude also improves um, day by day. Uh, you know, if you, even I took a taxi today and then I learned from taxi driver. So this kind of learning everywhere, it's an important attitude as well. And I, in, obviously there was no money uh, in my early age. And then I found that this is super important uh, because that brings a lot of energy to make you work hard. So even you don't have money, it means you have great energy to achieve. So, and then also I failed. It's failure, it's uh, that the first thing I learned from when, you know, as soon as I came uh, into the society. But um, I learned that it's okay to be failed. It's okay because there is another chance. Actually, there are a lot greater chance because uh, you learn a lot uh, from the failure. So, yeah, and then uh, with a, a lot of um, stories, and finally I entered to Microsoft. But if you will believe, you know, in like company like Microsoft, it's a huge uh, international company will uh, save your life, but that's not true at all. So <laughs> it's, again, without these, you know, like attitudes that I mentioned earlier, uh, it's almost impossible to survive because this is like jungle jungles. It's it's the same to women and fem uh, women as well as men. It's same, but who does have that attitudes to, um, you know, uh, have a strong energy and also try to learn from everywhere and then learn from failure and also um, try to contribute to the others. That's the key attitude that you can survive, not the company or not your not the backgrounds you have. And um, yeah, and also there was a failure as well. So I'd like to emphasize that a lot of people think, you know, like successful people or like um, think uh, people, it's just we watch on the iceberg, top, top of the iceberg, the, but the beneath of the iceberg, there are a lot of things. But the most important thing is failure. Um, I've seen a lot of people Actually, I've seen two thousand, more than two thousand, um, like um, um, you know, software industry experts or leaders, and then I found out most of them, uh, they you know, see failure as the essential of the mastery. So, you know, like we too much like women too much emphasize on dedication, work hard, and good habit, but really fear about the failure. But uh, in the f especially for you know like this AI, um, it, you know we are going to more like AI in you know, a society and you know, force wave of uh, revolutions. Those kind of um, 
you know, IT industry leading uh, society requires a lot of, uh, you know, failure um, attitude. So it doesn't mean that you fail and then you just don't go to the next next step. It it should come accompany with persistence. So even though you p fail, you have to be persistent. So especially women will face a lot of difficulties in in earlier career because at the, you know, like m maybe you. Uh, find a good partner to marry with, or if you decide to have a children, um, then it would be super difficult uh, to uh, you know come together with work and life or ca taking care of others. But um, you know this kind of uh, difficult situations, or you feel like failure. But it, it, it's it's key thing that you can uh, survive is that persistence. Even though you have uh, that difficulties or, or failure, you you can you should you you know continue to the persistence. So yeah, so tenacity or resilience matters, and. Um, I I'm not sure how how much time I I have more to talk, but you know to gain the resilience or tenacity, I don't usually focus on the hard work or good habits, but rather you you know build something you know the community you can to, you can work or play or study together because you know being fail and you know being persistent it's not easy it's very difficult um, things if, especially when you are alone it's almost impossible no one can do that but nowadays a lot of pressures on each individual to you know to go through that difficult time alone so but especially uh, not not only for women but uh, you know nowadays male it's difficult as well but I really emphasize to learn how to uh, to make a partnership and to you know work together with the community so that you can actually you know build yourself uh, a strengths inner strengths as well as can contribute to the other success so this is some you know communities list that I've um, enjoyed a lot, and then um, you know helped me to uh, you know ten to to gain the tenacity attitude when I have a failure, a lot of failures in my life. So yeah, this is the examples and something you should learn um, in in your life that how you can actually you know build your own brand um, you know by contributing to the success of others it can be you know if you are more introvert you probably able to just write things and then share with others with your knowledge or uh, you know informations or experiences or like maybe a little bit aspirational then you can write a book or you are a little extrovert maybe you can organize this kind of conference or speak this is something you know we gain together the um, you know like uh, uh, the the wisdom or together and support each other so this is, uh, I think, the yeah. So I would l really emphasize uh, to build a good, um, you know, attitude for, to survive in the in your career. Um, not only for women, but also uh, men. Um, share your knowledge and experience as much as possible. To what? To help to grow community. So um, not only for growing, helping you know yourself grow, but also grow community. Then you can gain very you know inevitable uh, power, which is um, ability to make people voluntarily to listen to your opinion and knowledge. And this is the ability. Uh, this called is community leadership, and this is the ability that requires um, everyone in, in current um, you know, uh, you know, society and as well as the future as well. So this can be a, a great ability for uh, women to you know, gain the equality in the work and also be a good partner with uh, uh, the other colleagues or partners so that we can you know, all um, contribute to the success of ourselves as well as uh, others. Uh, this is yeah, the presentation I can I want to share. Yep.
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lee. It was great that we uh, could learn from your own experiences and how you survived in the competitive IT industry. Now we have a presentation from a group of students at Gyeonggi University. Five students worked together to report young generation's challenges in their transition to labor market. And two students, Sa Young Kim and So Young Song, will talk about the issues in Korea representing the student group. Please welcome So Young and Sa Young. Thank you, Professor. Uh, good evening. I'm Soyoung Kim, majoring in political science and uh, international relations, and this is Soyoung Sung, majoring in sociology. Uh, before we start our presentation, I would like to address one thing. On behalf of our team, constituted for five undergraduates from Gyeonggi University, I would like to express my gratitude to Ms. Irina Bokuba, Ms. Susanna Markura, and Ms. Soyang Lee for insightful presentations today. And it's such an honor to make a presentation of South Korean female youth for GWL event. Let me introduce the theme of our presentation first, which is moving forward a practical guidance to understand South Korean female youth. In this sense, our team had focused on four major points. Uh, those are overall uh, status of South Korean female youth and major gender issues in the workplace and case of China and Japan, and lastly, uncertainty in future career path. So, what is happening to South Korean female youth in recent years? In 2019, South Korea ranked 20th in youth unemployment rate of OECD. Compared to the rankings in 2009, South Korea was one of the three states, South Korea, Italy, Greece, where the number of unemployment youth increased despite the decrease of economically active youth population. And secondly, unemployment rate is closely linked to the suicide rate. Silent massacre, massacre is the term to call the increasing suicide rates among women. Especially, it means the increasing suicide rates of South Korean millennial women who are susceptible to be excessive labor forces based on the instant necessity. In contrast, men are considered as a major labor force so that they are less vulnerable to economic crisis than women, as we can see in the graph. This resembles the situation in Europe, where women's suicide rate is dependent on the rate of women's participation in labor markets. Back to the case of South Korea, South Korean female youth have no other alternatives but to stick to labor-oriented life cycle in order to survive in the labor markets hostile to women. And amid COVID-19 outbreak, as the presenters had mentioned before, there were massive heat on service sector and non-regular jobs where women vastly outnumber men. And in consequence, women accounted for two thirds of the country's job losses last year. What is worse is that much of the government's stimulus check this year, including the proposed fourth extra visit, has focused on protecting vulnerable jobs and workers, but hasn't done much in resolving gender inequality. In this regard, our team selected two major gender issues in the workplace in South Korea. To begin with, I'd like to point out the gender discrimination in recruitment process. Discrimination towards women applicants is prevalent regardless of the economic sector in South Korea. Forging the final scores in favor of men applicants and allotting larger male quota are the typical practices. Moreover, questions based on misogyny are commonly asked during job interviews. These include asking personal plan for marital status or excusing gender pay gap based on the compensation theory of mandatory conscription. In addition to the bias recruitment process, there is another issue, gender pay gap. In many workplaces, women applicants are expected to tolerate the gender pay gap. In other words, accepting unequal wage is one prerequisite for women to be employed. That when we look at the graph from the OECD, South Korea has the widest gender gap among seven, uh, 37 member states. The average gender pay gap is of OECD is just 13%. Then why does this occur? 
what are the main causes of gender discrimination in recruitment process? Well, now I, I will introduce some clues with which that we can sep speculate the roots of unequal treatment to women in the workplaces. Firstly, prejudice by gender operates in workplace such as women are not a patriarch or women are irresponsible. Secondly, jobs are strictly segregated by gender. More women take secondary tasks. On the other hand, more men take primary tasks. Human resources managers prefer men to women to solidify pre-existing system. The last reason is the family-unfriendly work workplace culture. Private firms hardly ensure work and life balance. It is hard to take time for family members due to overworking custom. In addition, welfare policy in childcare is either inadequate or insufficient. On the top of recruitment issue, segmented labor market plays a significant role in South Korea. Some research suggests the South Korean labor market is separated to, into two categories, the primary sector and the secondary sector. The bottom line is that workers in primary sectors have privileged social status with high income and employment stability but those in the secondary sector suffer for lower social status with low income and employment instability. Gendered labor market had been constantly driving out women to the, into the secondary sector. As you can see in the bar graph, the rate of female temporary workers is 50% point higher than those of male. In addition, Low wage risk of female workers is twice as high as that of male. On the other hand, polar polarization among women became greater. Highly educated women easily enter to the primary sector. However, at the same time, low educated women are driven to the secondary sector. Studies pinpoint that the labor market flexibility is the as the main cause of the gendered labor market. After the financial crisis in 1997 to 1999, South Korean labor market underwent massive restructuring with increasing numbers of unstable, flexible jobs and women turned out to be direct victims for it. That is, women are more likely to hire in part-time jobs. And why is that? South Korean government encourages women to take low quality jobs for immediate employment in fact. Especially women who experience career breaks due to childbirth and childcare cannot but take those positions. This is because women experience more challenges when they re-enter to the labor market due to their age and lack of time for time as mothers. This forms the vicious cycle in women's status in labor market. One specific sector occupied by women workers is professionality and significance face certain challenges. In the worst situation, it can be treated as a secondary sector. At the end, women can be struck by restructuring, outsourcing, and irregularization. Well, until, until now, we introduced the major gender issues in the workplace of South Korea. Now, I will discuss whether these issues are merely unique phenomena in South Korea or not. The question is, what, what about other Asian countries where share common Confucianism culture? Moving on to China and Japan, we can find coincidences. They also suffer from same problems. This is the this is the excerpt of job advertisement in China. Please add, pay attention to the job requirement. It stipulated that only men can apply for the job. 
Also, it requires to be able to work on weekend holidays and night shifts. It nearly forces to give a work-life balance. In addition, female candidates received stereotypical job irrelevant questions during the interview in 2021. In Japan, shikat sexism isn't a big issue. Shikat is a recruitment process for university students. Applicants are expected to wear gendered suits for job interview. Men should wear a white shirt and dark tie, and women should wear a skirt and white blouse. To break this kind of sexism, many movements, movements are rising. Kutu campaign against the recruitment for a requirement for women to wear high heels is the representative movement. Also, power-based sexual violence during job offer meeting was a hot issue in 2017. The victim accused the famous broadcaster and shocked out Japan by going public with her accusations. It has triggered Japan meeting movement. In conclusion, female youth in South Korea, China, and Japan share a similar burden of sustaining their volatile tanties. Aside from these present issues, uncertainty in future career path is likewise the burden to South Korean female youth. We get devastated with countless concerns towards the uh, future. To be specific, we suffer from the disparity or gap between the ideal future and the expected reality. Um, for instance, one acquaintance of mine who just turned 21 years old hesitates to take the exam for the diplomatic candidate selection due to the unassured work and life balance and concerns for responsibilities as a mother and a wife. Struggling to compromise within this framework is not a surprise. Breaking the ice ceiling is also an important task for us. Um, for me, who desires to serve as a diplomatic services as my acquaintance does, it's hard to be motivated because women are rare in the high ranking positions, um, such as ambassadors in strategic regions. Even though the overall reality induces female youth to be discouraged in anticipating the future, many of those are willing to band together by breaking through those obstacles. In this regard, I firmly believe that the key for solving those issues would be laid on multilateral cooperation. Building solidarity and sharing experiences and knowledge through events such as GWL Integration Dialogue today can help not only South Korean female youth, but also female youth across the globe. I'd like to bring up with one meaningful quote from previous GWL event. It is now the time to raise our voice for change and inclusion and move from words to actions. Since I'm one of the South Korean female youth who realizes the structural difficulties nowadays, I'm grateful to participate in this event and able to get opportune advices from the global women leaders that I look up to. I hope future GWL dialogues build up momentum for discovering the common features across the border and enhancing mutual understandings of female youth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Soyoung and Soyoung. I was thrilled to hear the voices of young generation in Korea with a brief analysis of the current situations in Korea. Now, uh, this is the time for our main event, we will have a dialogue between speakers and students. We have three broad topics. First, we would like to ask about how global women leaders have navigated challenging situations at workplaces and try to change such difficult situations. Uh, do students have any questions about this topic? I have a question. Can I question? Yes, uh, Kayon, please ask your question. Yeah. When you face difficult situations, how do you decide when and how you would speak your own voices? Your own voice. Yeah, this is a question about uh, when 
uh, you face difficult situations such as gender stereotype or some negative uh, assessments on your treatment, how do you decide when and how you would speak up your own voices or to change uh, your organizations? Susanna Maikura, do you want to start your answer? Thank you very much. And let me start by recognizing the amazing presentation made by the two students. It was a great a piece of work. The fact that you show data that you had a thorough analysis of the situation is, is something that is, is very impressive. But I have to say uh, that is, is not the case in, in Korea only. So th that's the reason why we, we are working hard to try and change that. And, and, and to change it, you need really, really public policies that are aligned with the needs of women. And that's why governments are so important in this reality. Let me give you an example that shows that the world has changed, but not that much. I'm an engineer. And when I was looking for my first job, um, at the time I was an assistant professor at the university and the professor whom I, were work, I was working with was a very recognized engineer in his area. And he wrote a letter of recommendation for me to a job that, I, that was posted and I was uh, applying to. So his letter of recommendation was very important. And I went through all the interviews and I thought I had done very well. And I was called to the fourth interview with the director of human resources. And I was convinced that that was to say, the job is yours. When I met him, he said to me, unfortunately, we cannot give you the, the job because you're a woman. And that really, really upset me. And I said to him, listen, had you read my resume, you would have realized that I was a woman just by reading my name. So why waste our time? Well, he wasted the time, they wasted the time because I had a letter of recommendation for a very senior uh, engineer who they, it was a customer of them and they wanted to have an excuse why I couldn't have the job. Since they couldn't find a, a, a technical excuse, they couldn't find a real excuse, they just used the only one they had, which was that I was a woman. So this is something that you have to recognize that as much as progress has been made, there are significant biases in the processes, significant biases. So what I will say is just stand up, just work harder. There is no other chance for the time being that work harder. As a, our speaker said, um, recognize that failure is something that will take place and learn from it and take a strength from it and be absolutely ready to raise your voice. And that's why we call ourselves Voices for Change and Inclusion. It gets to the point where you have to say what you think. Do it nicely, do it gently. You don't have to be aggressive, but do say what you have to say because it is not only enough to sit at the table, you have to speak at the table. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Susanna Malkora. Uh, I was really impressed uh, by the fact that you honestly shared your own experience in the recruitment process. And uh, I would like to hear uh, the response from Ms. Irina Bokoba for the same question. Uh, Ms. Bokoba, can you share your own thoughts on this question? How uh, did you talk about or speak up your own voices when you faced a difficult situation? Um, thank you very much, uh, both for this question and for the presentation. So like Susanna, I think the presentation was amazing. Uh, it was uh, very accurate. It was very sincere. It uh, really uh, put the light uh, uh, on the spot. I think uh, also that uh, uh, this type of uh, obstacles and prejudices are <clears throat> not only uh, typical uh, for Korea. And I know that there is a, a very lively debate uh, in Korean society from all, all my uh, visits and um, engagement opportunities. Uh, and I think it is very healthy that such a debate is being taken with the frankness and openness. Uh, I would just go a little bit back.
back, I'm, I'm going back to uh, uh, what um, uh, Mrs. Lee said uh, initially. I think she raised a very important point, um, uh, the point about failure. Uh, because I know that uh, there are a number of extremely interesting uh, uh, papers, analysis uh, done in uh, uh, universities, in Columbia University, in Harvard University, in Stanford, uh, uh, some years ago that were presented uh, uh, in the Global Economic Forum. Uh, uh, I was there at one such debate, and uh, it was amazing to see indeed that um, we women, we are afraid of failure. Uh, and men are not afraid of failure. Uh, and um, uh, I know from, from data that 60% uh, of men that are going for a job, that are applying for a job, uh, they know that they're not up to the uh, requirements, but they apply. Women want 100% to be uh, uh, in conformity with everything that is there. We aspire for excellence. And that's why uh, one of the worst fears for us is failure. And I think we just have to come to terms with this because the life is, uh, uh, is different. You may fail, but you go on and you continue and you learn also from, from your, uh, your experience like Ms. Lee just, uh, just mentioned. Um, and from my own uh, experience, I would like to take up two points. First is uh, my personal experience when I joined uh, uh, the foreign ministry of my country and I wish uh, also uh, you joined the foreign ministry of Korea. I know that uh, you need more women, uh, different levels and ambassadors and I have seen amazing women diplomats uh, equally uh, in the United Nations. I think Susanna also uh, has met them. Uh, I think what is, when I, when I applied, there were not very many women and uh, I knew that uh, probably uh, I will just go until certain, but I was not sure I will become ever an ambassador precisely for that reason. So women have families, they don't travel abroad. And uh, uh, if it is not maybe for the democratic changes that came in Eastern Europe, particularly in my country and that opened uh, uh, more the opportunities uh, for women to take up such jobs, uh, Maybe I would not have been there, but I want to say something that uh, I had an extraordinary mentors, men, and uh, they were very committed uh, also to uh, uh, equality. Uh, they were mentoring me, they were supporting me, they were giving me opportunities uh, to grow. And this is where uh, I, I really believe that uh, men are important uh, in this process uh, um, because we are not uh, uh, in our uh, ambitions and in our quest for equality. Uh, it is not a fight, it is not a war against men. Uh, it is really uh, about partnerships, it is about equality. It is about working together. It is about contributing uh, to, to, to societies equally. And I think mentoring uh, is, uh, is important. And this is how further on uh, I could get uh, my, my career. But I have to admit that when I was elected uh, as the first woman director general of UNESCO, I have to admit that there were some male colleagues from the staff that were not entirely uh, convinced uh, that um, I can do the job. Um, and I remember my first uh, senior management team meeting. Uh, uh, I received a couple of emails from directors who have been there for a long time uh, at UNESCO, who were telling me a little bit condescending and paternalistically, well, actually, Director General, you did quite well uh, during this first uh, uh, senior management team meeting. So I laughed, uh, to be very frank, uh, inside myself. I just decided to ignore them. And I, I said I will convince them by, by example, by word. But there was this uh, spirit of uh, uh, uncertainty and a little bit of uh, disbelief that, uh, you know, I can cope particularly with a very complex political situation because the United Nations is political and uh, sometimes you walk into minefields uh, um, in order to cope with the very big uh, political problems and reconcile and bring everybody together. Uh, and I think this is the moment probably when, uh, when I convinced them because there were moments uh, when you're at this level, of course you consult, uh, you take advice, but at the end of the day, you take the decision. It is your responsibility. Uh, and you feel quite lonely uh, there when you take this responsibility. Sometimes you take a responsibility. Somebody said, no, 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 if you go too far or you don't do. And I said, I have to do this because I, I, I'm responsible for that. Uh, this is uh, 
this is my job. So when you take this responsibility, I think this was the moment um, when you start feeling uh, the uh, support and the respect of the others. And the second issue I want to raise, also very important, um, being in such position, uh, I had also to go through uh, all these recruitment processes. And uh, uh, and when I took over UNESCO, the uh, women in senior management positions were 23%. And I said, when I leave the organization, I want to make it 50-50. I want really to show by example that uh, I can change the face of this organization. So I went through recruitment processes. And I have to also fight, but from another position, from the position of a leader, I had to fight these biases. Um, I um, have confronted many times uh, situations where uh, we uh, are uh, uh, recruiting uh, somebody at the director position, important position, and they were kind of a stereotyping uh, positions for, for men uh, at UNESCO. There has never been uh, assistant uh, director general for science, for example. There has been for culture, for education, but never for science. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there has never been a director of the big hydrological program of the organization. And hydrology is very much a male dominated. It's a very much male dominated area. So when I launched the recruitment, uh, I had to return the uh, list of uh, potential candidates uh, to the panel because they presented me only men. I said, there should be women there uh, in this list, just broaden it, give me also the opportunity to look at women and many qualified women were applying, but they were never presented among this. So finally, when we went through this list and we found uh, a number of women and we started discussing this, uh, the qualities of women, what comes into uh, this, of course, there are two, always there are two arguments. Uh, are they sufficiently professional and are they strong? So this comes always, are they strong? Well, we need the strong. They said, oh, no, no, we need the strong director here. It's a very complicated uh, program. It's a difficult program. We need somebody strong. And at the end of the day, I ask them, look, we are speaking, define me what strength is when we speak about the director of hydrological program. It's not somebody that is going to carry water somewhere in the world. We need somebody who understands, uh, who is really a professional, who has the commitment to it. And at the end of the day, I appointed once again for the first time, a woman from Mexico. Now she is the director of the hydrological program institute in Mexico. She went back there. Very successful, uh, uh, I would say, uh, professional there and the director at UNESCO. But you have to have the commitment, you have to have the political will to find, to, to overcome these uh, stereotypes. And I'm very happy that when I left the organization, the senior positions, 50%, even at the D2 and above, when we speak about uh, the grades uh, uh, at uh, the United Nations, Women took 68% of these positions. Very often we, uh, we got together around the table, we discussed issues with member states and others, and there were only women. It just came natural. It is not something that, uh, but you have to have a commitment, a true commitment to identify this and to appoint them. So this is my response. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Bokova. I think you raised really interesting and important points in addition to what Ms. Malkora talked about. Uh, so finally, I want to ask the same question to Ms. Lee about how you overcome the difficult situations. In your presentation, you talked about attitude and I believe that you have your own strategy to navigate uh, the challenging situations at workplaces. Thank you for asking me. Uh, it was great answers, all of um, the speakers here. And actually, I have one boy and one girl as uh, my children. So it's really easy, you know, like, and to watch them, how they grow. So for this male, like son, you know, he knows that if he doesn't study hard and if he really cannot find good job, he cannot be married. <laughs> or he knows he, his life will be very miserable. So he 
you know, seems to have more, like he learns um, how to live his life very early, in early age. But my daughter, but it's, I think it's a second, so maybe she's not matured enough, but still she's 12 years old, so she's, she's matured enough, but, you know, she, you know, feels, she, she pursue what she loves. She doesn't really care about the responsibility in his life, in her life career. So, but as a parent, and also I feel like, um, I feel like if she pursue what she loves, I don't push her to do more responsible tasks for her successful career in the future, because I've been, you know, in that position to become a really responsible for my, you know, family's financial situation because my husband is kind of part-time uh, timer. So I, I am the main, you know, like a. Uh, 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 economy, you know, like a survivor. So uh, that's, that's, it's not easy task for, you know, like both men and women who become a sore responsible for economy, you know, family economy. Um, that's, I think, uh, causes all this kind of inequality in the, in, 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 com in workforce. And we actually see a lot of males dying in factory working you know, workers, right? We don't hear a lot among the news that female died from factories. It's like a dangerous works. So, and we, you know, have, you know, every male has to serve army service more than two years. They have to sacrifice for the country while female doesn't. So I think these are the reason why there are inequality uh, in, exists. So how I survive in this situation, because um, in company, in company, my managers know that I'm, I'm same to men <laughs> because I'm responsible for economy, uh, family economy. So if I don't work uh, or they don't really, uh, you know, right, recognize my work, I will be the same situation as them. You know, I see a lot of uh, male workers in Korea uh, they, are, they have a huge burden in their life. If they, you know, not successful in the company, they're like, like usually their wives will leave with him or <laughs> usually like children will be very, very poor. Like, so they, they, their attitude in the work force, it's a, it, it's a slightly di different as I could um, recognize. But so I don't say that you know, so because of this, you, you become the same as male, but, you, you know, it's important to understand each other's pain and build the empathy. And while I was actually in that uh, situation, like um, in, in earlier my career, you know, my manager, the male, usually male manager, doesn't want to promote me uh, and promote male because that male colleague has you know three uh, family in, in you know he has to support so um, and especially that job actually I didn't like that much that that's what I found and then you know even though there is inequality if I really like if I really passionate about it I can actually put more energy more positive energy more good positive impact in the workforce so that everyone love me to become a leader right so it doesn't matter about um, you know male or female but even though a male has a very difficult situation but um, the other like female has a lot bigger impact or positive impact. There is no reason that a manager says, oh, you are, because you are female, you cannot be promoted. So it's impossible. But I found out I, I cannot be in that situation if I, I don't like that position or that, that job. So I looked for very aggressively for my um, career that I can pursue the passion, my passion. And then finally I found it, it was very, very difficult. I have to go uh, graduate school and, you know, like I have to take a lot of um, exams to test out. So 
then I finally find out um, this career and then I loved it. And then the more I love it, I put my energy and passion about it. I bring more positive impact. And then, you know, more and more my, um, you know, careers went up to, you know, like I not, I don't say I'm, you know, career, it's too, very successful, but still I, I love it. And then I believe my, you know, like leaders love how my energy that I bring uh, to the company and the organization. And I love because of this job, uh, I can grow people. Like I can, I can help. I can contribute to, us, to the many people's success. I actually helped um, more than 200, you know, community leaders become a Microsoft employees, and I love it. And then I, I really want to uh, deliver the key, you know, uh, the reason why these people are successful, and uh, you know, more and more companies want what kind of people and what kind of attitude we need. So. Yeah, this is my answer, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Lee. It, it seems that the employers may prefer individuals who take the responsibilities of breadwinner roles, uh, so uh, the employers may support those individuals. And So Young uh, really worked hard to survive and uh, be aggressive workers in, in her uh, company. So. Because we are running out of time, uh, I would like to move on the second topic. We have learned how three women have uh, navigated uh, ver various situations in their workplaces. So more on this topic, yeah. Uh, we would like to discuss how being a woman and having various identities as a woman uh, help you move forward in your professional world. Uh, being a woman means uh, you have a lot of identities, not only as a professional, but uh, other identities. Any questions or thoughts from students? Yeah, Hannah, uh, can you ask a question? Um, okay, so before projecting my question, I would like to, to thank you again for the inspiring speeches as mentors shaping our voices and empowering us as future generations for achieving the gender equality in our society. So as Ms. So Young Lee mentioned in her most motivating speech, we all have diverse identities in our life, which I believe is so for Ms. Irina Bakova and Ms. Susanna Molkora and all others. Uh, so my question is, when you had uh, multiple identities, such as being a mother, being a daughter, and pursuing a pr professional career, how did you manage to handle all those roles successfully? Uh, how were you able to creatively reconcile and navigate through these somewhat conflicting responsibilities? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Hannah. I think it's a, a very great and, and important question. And I, do, I would like to ask uh, to Ms. Irina Vukova first to respond to Hannah's question. Um, this, uh, I would like to say, is uh, an eternal question uh, for women because uh, we will always be mothers. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, the, sometimes uh, the prime carers for the elderly, for, the, for our families, uh, but also at the same time, we want to pursue professional careers. In my particular case, uh, I would uh, say that uh, I was happy to, at those times, uh, to uh, have an environment uh, around me, a very supportive environment around me. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the uh, very developed uh, system of uh, childcare facilities in my country, in Bulgaria. Uh, and until this, uh, this moment, um, I think my country, Bulgaria, within the European Union, is, has, has the most generous a system of supporting women with the uh, paid and unpaid leave, one year paid leave for a woman to take care of a child, two years of unpaid leave, uh, going back uh, to her job in a very developed uh, system of uh, nurseries and uh, uh, all the other uh, facilities. I think this is very important and this is one of the uh, I would say the uh, responsibilities also of governments, of the state, of local communities and others to create uh, such a system of facilities which is affordable, uh, which is a high quality, a good quality, uh, so that uh, uh, women uh, may uh, be involved in the workforce. The other, 
uh, is also the um, legislative framework of uh, uh, taking uh, this leap uh, shared uh, between uh, the two parents. Um, there is a possibility also in my country, in other European countries, uh, that uh, men also can take leap in order to, uh, to care about their children. Uh, so I think um, this type of uh, uh, sharing uh, responsibilities within a family uh, is very important. Um, the other, of course, is the uh, creating uh, the framework of uh, uh, family-friendly uh, working environment. And this is where uh, the uh, private sector companies and others um, uh, have to be uh, pushed stronger uh, in order for them uh, to make uh, such a uh, such environment. Uh, uh, it, it depends, of course, on the industry, on, it depends on many things, uh, uh, whether it's a flexible working hours, whether it's changing the overall culture. And some of you at the beginning, when you presented the obstacles for uh, you to enter the workforce and to stay there, uh, some of you uh, mentioned this culture, uh, which is uh, not entirely a family culture. Uh, and this is very important that uh, this uh, overall uh, culture changes. But uh, I wouldn't say that uh, it was easy. I also had two children, a boy and a girl. Uh, but what I noticed, uh, because I have been always uh, busy, busy, and, uh, and I noticed that uh, my son, um, who is a bit, uh, uh, he's the elder child, uh, now they're grown-ups. Uh, uh, I, I remember that... Uh, my child, uh, my son at some point uh, started uh, telling me how much he respected what I'm doing. He respected me that I was active and doing things. So this probably was the most rewarding moment, not just to hear it from my daughter, but to hear it also from my son. So at that moment, I thought that maybe with example, I have educated him also to be more uh, responsive, to be uh, gender equal and to be respecting uh, for the uh, women uh, taking uh, such uh, such positions. So this is my my experience. Thank you so much, uh, Miss Irina Vokova. I uh, hope uh, Miss Susanna Makora uh, answer the question. Could you uh, respond to the question that Thank Hannah you. asked? Absolutely, and you know, is the first thing I will say is to recognize that family responsibility must be a shared responsibility. Yes, it's true that women are the ones who bring children to this world, but this is a shared project. It's a project that a couple has. So the fact that we assume this journey as a shared responsibility, and it was the case for me, I have a partner of 42 year plus. Uh, that made a big difference, you know, because uh, we, we took turns on doing things and, and we, we co-share things. So that is it's a big difference. So to me, that's significant. And I would say uh, we as parents have the responsibility, as Irina said, especially mothers, to convey this notion of a, a, a different perspective on how you bring up a family and also how you see women delivering their contribution to society. That's the main thing. In my country did not have such a well-established a, a, a system to take care of the children. I had my mother with me. We do have the larger family to help. So that was part of my, my support system. Uh, and of course, in the end, you have to prioritize and when you prioritize and you have limited time, eh, you are you postpone yourself, your own personal priorities. You know, time to read, time to take a little bit time off. That you you delay. But let me say something here. All of this comes back to the notion of setting the right policies and having the private sector assuming their share of responsibility. And none of this will happen unless the development of policies has a gender lens. And that's why it is so important also to have women involved in government decisions and, and, and in decisions at large. Societies are 50% women, even more than that, and 50% men. Decisions must be taken representing society and the needs of society. So it's a circle here. It's not only your personal situation and how you handle it, it's how you set the frame from 
the public policies to establish normative environments for, for the private sector or their own private sector willingness to take on these issues and really have a women-friendly environment. So it's a combination of all of that. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Makora. Uh, finally, uh, So Young, do you want to anything uh, to the to the response? Yeah, really so, quickly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, considering our our own country situation, so I cannot say. It, maybe we are in the between. So whether we have some system uh, to take care of daycare system, but also we cannot solely uh, depend on that daycare system because of many reasons. Uh, but uh, that obviously, you know, the government is working very hard toward that, uh, you know, building that strong system, but it takes time because uh, because of the you know economic history of Korea has been it's very short. So I think this welfare system will be uh, backed up very soon. Uh, but it takes time. But in the in the between, how we should do? Like for example, for me, I do not have parents to support. Either I cannot you know they, I can use daycare for a short time, but I cannot you know like uh, full time. Um, so. I hired uh, many, like Korean, you know, Chinese, uh, you know, people who actually, you know, sort of like grandma, like um, uh, it's not paid grandma, right? So uh, she helped me, uh, our family, and uh, my kids still love grandma, like every kinds of grandma, because they raised by those, um, you know, like a, um, the workforce, and uh, you know, like. You will. F I had twelve nannies in my life, like two for like ten years. So sometimes it was short, but sometimes it's long. Uh, but it's important that you have strong partnership um, with that nanny, as well as your husband, and as well as children as well. Like children, like now they are now in in house. They have to. They can learn how to prepare meals or you know like uh, support your parents because your parents work anyway so and also it's important that sometimes I, I should support my husband uh, for the housework but uh, also my husband needs to support sometimes but you know it, it can it cannot be all the time you know my when my husband didn't have a job she, he puts more efforts for my housework and I'm a little less busy that I put more uh, work on the housework. And so that's kind of partnership, like uh, to support each other. It's super, like now it's super important for everyone to survive in the future. Like, um, yeah, that's I can say. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, the dialogue is really stimulating. And the third topic that I want to bring up is how to empower women and collaborate and support each other across uh, various groups. So uh, because we are running out of time, I want uh, to one woman respond to this question. Uh, Ms. Irina Bokova, could you, uh, oh, yeah, any, any questions from students? Yeah, Sambong, could you uh, ask a question? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for thank you so much for sharing your personal experience and opinions. Um, I wonder. So, what recommendations would you give us to move forward and include women, men, and individuals with various sexual identities to speak up about gender equality issues? Do you have any ad advice for university students for the empowerment of women and other minorities? Thank you, Sanbong. Uh, Sanbong's question is about how to empower women, men, and various other groups. Uh, Ms. Irina Vokova, could you respond to this question? Well, I think it's uh, just uh, creating uh, the uh, uh, environment, the inclusive environment uh, in different uh, in different settings, uh, be it university or the uh, workforce. Um, um, I think uh, creating uh, this uh, culture of uh, respect uh, uh, 
uh, respect of the diversity, respect of the others, uh, respect of uh, human rights. Uh, um, I think it is uh, it is critical. This is just the foundation of uh, of any such uh, such approach. And then, uh, of course, uh, you may look at some specific measures uh, depending uh, uh, on whether you are talking about academic environment or work environment. Uh, um, this is coming uh, nowadays uh, very strongly. And uh, uh, what uh, at the very beginning, uh, Susanna said. Uh, I think there was a lot of a drive a movement towards such kind of inclusion that was promoted by the uh, United Nations. Uh, and now I'm afraid that we are seeing a little bit of setback of this uh, because of the um, other ideas uh, coming, uh, which are contradicting this approach. Um, and, uh, and that is why we, we started our group because we thought that um, um, it is important to keep the same uh, the same uh, um, sense of inclusiveness, of, uh, not to lose uh, some of this big momentum that the uh, United Nations uh, has done in terms of, uh, of human rights, gender equality, inclusiveness, and and all the others. Uh, uh, so um, I think you can you can do it. Uh, you just have to create uh, uh, this uh, um, this respect towards the others, and uh, uh, of course you have to bring it into education. You have to educate young people from early on about this type of, uh, of approach. So this will be my answer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, even though we are running out of time, I want to uh, ask Ms. Markora if you have anything to add to what Irina said. Do you have anything to add? Well, is Irina, Irina said it well. Um, I think it's, it's the responsibility of leadership to create that conducive environment. So um, for leaders to recognize that if for societies to thrive, for groups to thrive, they have to be inclusive and embracing of all perspectives, of all groups, of all uh, approaches. But uh, when that is not the case, we have to find people like you, young people who are ready to raise the right, right questions, to put forward the issues that you care about and to put the right pressure on leadership to be cognizant that this is something that is needed and that is very important. So it's the responsibility of leaders in one side, but it's also your shared responsibility to bring to the forefront those issues that you think are central to your own development and to your own future. So do not hesitate, raise your voice gently, nicely, but put forward the questions you care about. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Maikora. Uh, today's dialogue has been really stimulating um, and uh, the today's dialogue have reminded us of how supporting each other is ever more important uh, and the world is tightly connected and uh, we are not isolated in the global community but we are influenced and we are influencing each other. Uh, so uh, we need to work together. So not only for women but also for the global community acknowledging that women's issue is issues for everyone is critical to advance the world more equal and peaceful. Multilateralism, cooperation, and concerted action across generations are ever more needed. As our three speakers have pointed out today, building up sisterhood with a support network, contributing to others' success, and making a collegial environment becomes crucial for transforming and changing the world. With such shared interest and attention to gender equality and other minorities, we will be able to build and recover our societies. So we have learned that Global Women Readers Voices have made tremendous effort for offering practical help and advice for many women all over the world. Uh, they have also tried to uh, make significant changes in the world and the world has advanced in the areas of gender equality, for sure, uh, but the pace of progress has been uh, really slow. 
Although the future does not bright uh, due to structural constraints sometimes, we believe that the today's event is not a small step, but an important milestone to hear voices from young readers and make it heard from the top readers as well. So the result of our dialogue today will be delivered to the GWL team and also shared in the Gender Equality, Generation Equality Forum uh, in Paris in June this year. Also, it will be delivered to the public universities, civil societies, and international organizations who are interested in the voices of future generations. On behalf of many participants at Gyeonggi University, I express my deep gratitude to people who organized and participated in the dialogue. I hope this is an important breakthrough to increase mutual understandings between men, women, and other groups. And we also like to see continuous dialogue among individuals across different cultures and generations. Again, thank you very much for your time and participation. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.